Hello, hi everybody. I welcome you to a new session on Free Current Affairs Crash Course. Today we are going to be discussing a few topics related to economic current affairs. The 10 topics that we are going to see today are 1. The PMC Bank Crisis, the DICTC, Supervised Reaction Framework, Prompt Corrective Action, all related to the PMC Bank Crisis, the leverage ratio, the oil prices, petroleum reserves, on tap licensing, the authority for IFSC, and finally, we are going to end up our discussion with the ease of doing business. The first topic, as we have seen, is going to be PMC Bank crisis. So we are not going to de discuss the A to Z of what happened around the PMC Bank crisis, rather, we are going to limit our discussion to what was the nature of the crisis and what was the action which the RBI took and did it have the propriety to take such an action? From where does it draw its power to take such action? What kind of regulatory lapses were present in this bank? What kind of supervisory power does it have and has it taken any steps to strengthen those powers? And finally, the related outcomes or we can say the follow-up action that was taken post the PMC crisis. This is going to be our discussion. We are going to have a discussion within the bounds of these four. One, what kind of a crisis was this PMC crisis? Understand dear friends, this crisis was not related to the deterioration of the asset quality of the bank. Understand it was purely an audit scam or we can say that this was a disclosure fraud. It had given out certain kind of loans to one particular family of institutions which goes by the name Housing Development Infrastructure Group. They had opened nearly 44 accounts and they had been exposed to nearly 6,000 crores of loans over the last few years. Nearly 7 years this scam has been going and over the years this 44 accounts has been spread out as 21,000 fake accounts. Imagine the scale of how many fake accounts have been opened. So after coming to know about this, there was a worker in the PNC itself who flagged this as a concern to the RBA. RBA took stock of the situation, took the control of the PMC and imposed certain restriction on its normal functioning. And as a consequence, it put a threshold or it restricted the withdrawal capacity of the depositors. That is why many of the depositors were going through hardships and they were demanding that the RBI should relax the norms. Why was everybody asking the RBI to dilute its position or to be kind of lenient to us? This was not a problem where the bank was going into insolvency or the bank's NPA was shooting up very high. In fact, when the scam was unearthed, it was sitting on 2% of NPS. So this is a very healthy level compared to other banks or other institutions. So its asset quality or the balance sheet itself didn't have a problem. What was the problem is it didn't disclose the amount properly. So whatever, the RBI had to take certain actions. And even though there was questions of whether the steps that it took was kind of an overreach, this was answered by the RBA itself. Now, we need to understand the structure of cooperatives and how they are regulated. Is the RBI regulating all cooperative banks? The answer is no. We could have heard that the NAVAD is the regulator for cooperatives. So what is the truth here? So both are true. If NABAD is a regulator, why should RBI be directly involved with the PMC? Should it not be the NABAD? So these kind of questions would be there in your minds also. For that, we are just going to refresh our basics here. How are the structure of cooperative institutions? The cooperative societies or cooperative banks here can be broadly classified into urban cooperatives and rural cooperatives. 
the, as far as the separation of functions are concerned or the regulatory supervision that has been interested to the central bank rbi has taken over this urban cooperative banks while nabard has been interested with the fun the responsibility of supervising all rural cooperative institutions if you take the mere numbers the number of cooperative banks surely the rural cooperative banks exceeds the urban cooperative banks i just want to show to you the full list here right see the list structure of cooperative credit institutions It can be urban and rural the rural is further divided into short and long under the short term structure we have state cooperative banks central cooperative banks and primary credit societies as far as the banking regulation act 1949 goes it doesn't include the credit society or primary agriculture societies under the ambit of bank it doesn't reckon them as bank itself what happens when it is not reckoning it as a bank there is a question so will it be covered under certain banking provisions or dicgc no it will be completely left out of the ambit will come to that in the later slides so what was the power which was invoked by the rbi in order to undertake certain restrictive actions on the pmc this was also in the news section 35a section 35a of the banking regulation act empowers the central bank the rbi to give direction to banks and also take action if at all it finds that the particular bank or an institution is taking certain actions that will be detrimental to the depositors or also for the interests of the banking company itself the section 35a was in the news because it is under this provision that the rbi took control of the bank now don't confuse this with another important 35a there is something called as article 35a in the constitution that is related to a special provision added for the affairs of jammu and kashmir which by now has been abrogated because 370 and 35a has also been deleted from the constitution so under this 35a if you see the raw text it says that only the rbi has the power to issue direction not the nabard but under this the rbi has delegated the powers to nabard and accordingly nabard has a supervisory powers to all rrbs regional rural banks and regional cooperative banks clear so what were the action that were taken or the consequences of pmc some important consequences we are going to see one this was taken around the month of february cooperative banks will now come under the rbi watch so as we have seen the separation that rural is with nabard urban is with rbi now in order to bring uniformity what the government has said is all cooperative banks will now be given under rbi so has to ensure that supervision will be stronger second in the wake of the crisis rbi has tightened something called as a supervisory action framework for urban cooperative banks and last the deposit insurance the so immediately in any instance where there is a case of a bank failure or an institute financial institution losing out there is a question that will always keep its head out one is how much of the money of the deposit is safe how safe are the deposit is money so this question was again coming out in the news and people were discussing one important provision called as the dicgc what is dicgc the little bit of history the concept of insuring depositors money came in the wake of 1929 great depression where thousands of american banks collapsed and along with it the depositors were rendered poor all their house savings all their lifetime savings were gone in a flash 
in order to avoid any such situation there were intensive discussion and they came out with insurance packages for all those deposits we were second in the world to actually experiment with it as soon as we got independence in 1950 itself after the banking regulation act and the rbi nationalization the government and the rbi were talking about insuring the depositors and accordingly in 1961 the deposit insurance corporation was instituted by the government its function was to insure depositors money and this was limited to only commercial banks all depositors of commercial banks will be given some amount of protection in case the banks fail and subsequently in 1971 there was another similar corporation or institution that was also instituted called the credit guarantee corporation understand you people are making a deposit and they face a risk saying that banks may fail imagine the likelihood of a bank failing to pay depositors versus the likelihood of a borrower paying back from the banks is likely high so there should be some kind of guarantee for the credit also for credit risk also that was also talked about in order to give the lenders particularly banks and institution some breathing space the so credit guarantee corporation was also constituted in 1978 the dic and the cgci were merged and the present format of the dicgc which includes both deposit insurance functions as well as credit guarantee functions credit guarantee is meant as an insurance for the loan that the lenders are giving to others deposit insurance is a protection for depositors who are making deposits with the banks right after this there is obviously the first part is going to gain a lot of attention because deposit insurance the people's deposit how much of the deposit is insured if any somebody is going to make a deposit 1 crore is 1 crore going to be paid back if the bank is failing no there's going to be a threshold above which there will be no protection so this threshold has been revised over the years and the last such revision came in 1993 where the cover was increased to 1 lakh so all account holders whatever be the amount it could be 10 lakh 1 crore whatever it is they will be insured or they will be paid back 1 lakh rupees in case the bank fails so this was a very meager amount 30 days down the line 30 years down the line so in 2020 2019 when the pmc bank crisis emanated people were once again asking how safe is our deposits 1 lakh is actually a joke we should increase it so the rbi took it under consideration and the union budget 2020 it said that it has increased the coverage that will be given under the dicgc to 5 lakh you see the claims that is being settled under the dicgc it is very very low now let's also see about the insured banks we saw that in 161 when the dic was formed only commercial banks were formed brought under this ambit but now there has been a lot of banks even special banks such as special small finance bank payment banks rural rrbs local area banks and all the cooperative banks except agriculture societies they are not even considered as banks so they are outside the ambit of and also another glare omission is the nbfc the nbfcs are also not covered under the dicgc right and another follow up action that was taken by the rbi was in the month of january it said i am going to revise the supervisory action framework so what is the supervisory action framework i think uh, it's better for us to see the next topic and then come for this the next topics is prompt corrective action so what is this prompt corrective action as the name suggests there is going to be an corrective action if at all a failure 
or a failure by a bank to comply with certain standards or norms is reflected, it will prompt the RBI to take certain corrective actions. So what are the parameters? We are going to see four parameters. One is the capital parameter. Capital is one thing. So in order to find how adequate capital a bank is having or a safe level of capital is in Parker Dhaha, two indicators we are going to see the CAR and CCB capital conservation buffer. CAR is an outcome of Basel 1, CCB is an outcome of Basel 3. In the Rindula, as we know, 9% is the minimum of CAR which has to be maintained by all banks. 2.5% capital conservation buffer maintained and that the RBI has been maintaining or been implementing in banks since 2015 and in 2019 it should be 2.5 but 2019 maintain 2020 it was postponed again it has been postponed to September 2020 we have had a discussion in the previous video which you can find in the part 2 of the free crash course. So these are parameters and it could be 9, a bank could be 9, a bank could be having 8, a bank could be having 7. So these are the threshold, if it is 9, if it is falling below 9, some kind of restrictions will take place, if it is falling beyond 8, then some kind of restrictions. If it is falling below 4.25, then some kind of restrictions will again be taking place. So these are the ideas. So these are the trigger mechanism. So if a bank is triggering the risk capital parameter under risk threshold 1, there are a set of actions that will be taken. We need not go through all those actions. It's a, a very large guideline. I don't think it's necessary for us. The second broad parameter is the asset quality. How to understand the asset quality? It is through the NPA. If the NPA is very high, this is risk threshold 12. If it is becoming 12, it is very high. If it is below 12 to 9, certain kind of actions. If it is above 6, then some kind of actions. Accordingly, certain actions will be kicked in. Profitability or it just says how much profit you have earned, return on assets. Two years negative means you will be brought under risk threshold 1 and the subsequent actions will be taken. Likewise, three years negative, loss for three years, loss for four years. Consecutively, if you are reporting a loss for four years, accordingly actions will be taken. The last criteria is the leverage. Leverage means how much uh, Above the capacity, you are jumping. That is what leveraging means. You are having 10 rupees, but with this 10 rupees, how much of uh, is the size of your business? With 10 rupees, if I am conducting a business of 50, that much is the leverage. The leverage ratio, we will have a discussion. I think we have the topic in the next slide. So, PCA is meant for scheduled commercial banks alone. All scheduled commercial banks, if at all they are going to fail in these respective categories, they will be bought under certain corrective action. So this is called as the prompt corrective action framework of the RPA. Right? So as we saw, the PCA is meant only for banks. What about cooperatives? What about NBFCs? How to monitor and how to ensure that they are also running their businesses smoothly and that their financial management is also proper. In 2014, on the lines of PCA, the RBA brought supervisory action framework which is meant for cooperatives. What cooperatives? For all cooperatives? No. RBA has the direct control of urban cooperatives. That is why the supervisory action framework is for urban cooperatives alone. It is not for all cooperatives. So under this, there has been certain conditions. Just as we had certain threshold in the PCA, here also there are certain threshold, such as the capital adequacy ratio being 9. If it is not 9, then the RBI will be taking such an actions like merging it with another bank 
or diluting it or degrading it to the status of a lending society. Clear? Profitability. If it is two year loss, accordingly certain action. This is the new clause that was inserted this year under the 2020 revision of the SAF supervisory action framework the asset quality which is saying 6 percentage if the NPA has increased 6 percentage accordingly certain action will be taken. So this is the revision in order to better monitor and control the working of urban cooperatives the RBA has taken this action. Now the leverage ratio. Leverage ratio and LCR has also been in the news recently. The leverage ratio we have seen as the direct outcome of we have seen in the PCA, the fourth pillar of PCA. So where do we have this leverage ratio? Leverage ratio and liquidity coverage ratio both are also an important outcome of Basel 3. Right? See, in the month of April, April 2020, in the second week following the aftermath of the coronavirus and also banks in a position to not lend and also the severe financial stress, the RBA has allowed that liquidity ratio can be brought down. Liquidity ratio here means the liquidity coverage ratio. So, what is liquidity coverage ratio? What are leverage ratio? We will see. First, the leverage ratio. Basel 3 introduced this. What is leverage? As we discussed, leverage means how much you are leaping beyond your capacity. I have 10 rupees and if I conduct a business operation of 10 rupees, I am leveraging one time. One time is jump on right. If I am doing a business of 20 rupees worth, I am leveraging two times. So most of the businesses will always be trying to leverage. Konjata vachikti nariya urpati panno nariya scale of operation increase panno nana panna. So that is always the case. But if you see financial institution banks, the leverage will be very very high. Take the example of any bank. If it is having a total asset of 1000 crores, avulo ruva maintain panna na, how much of their own funds they will be having? Very very less. So their leverage will be very high. We have something called as leverage ratio. The ratio will be the total tier 1 capital. Total tier 1 capital means own equity, own, own equity, own equity, which is the shareholders money, own shareholders money by total exposure. Let's say I have 4 rupees or 4 crore rupees that has been deposited or been invested by shareholders and this particular bank has made an exposure of 100 rupees the 4 by 10 into percentage will be 4 percentage so this bank is having a leverage of 4 percentage if another bank is there 2 by 100 so its percentage is 2 Percentage 2, the lower the leverage ratio, it means that Kunjata Vachita Adima business Pandrangan Arto. So this will be leveraging 25 times. 4 percentage means it is making a business of 100 rupee with 4 rupee in hand, its own hand, its own money. Likewise, this particular bank, which is having 2 percentage as leverage ratio, has leveraged 50 times. So this is. The higher the leveraging, the more the risk the bank is associated with. That's why we will have these numbers and we have minimum 3 percentage according to Basel norm. It says if you are going to do a business of 100 crore, ensure that you have your own funds at least 3 rupees. So this is the idea. USA is having 4.5 percentage and what does India have? We saw in the PCA guideline that minimum it should have 4. The 4 percentage is the minimum leverage ratio that has to be maintained by banks as of now. The liquidity coverage ratio. What is the liquidity coverage ratio? You see, 
இப்போ வந்து இட்ஸ் சிமிலர் டு தி எஸ்எல்ஆர் ஸ்டாச்சுட்ரி லிக்விடிட்டி ரேஷியோனு வச்சுப்போம் வேர் தி பேங்க்ஸ் ஆர் ரெக்வயர்ட் டு மெயின்டைன் சர்டன் அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் தேர் அசட்ஸ் இன் லிக்விட் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் எந்த அளவுக்கு லிக்விட் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் வச்சுருக்கீங்க கம்பேர்ட் டு த ரிஸ்க் தட் யூ ஆர் கோயிங் டு ஃபேஸ் comparing these two associating these two variables we have something called as the liquidity coverage ratio how much of the cover you are having how much cover you are having to manage your liquidity that is called as liquidity coverage ratio the epdi what is cover what is liquidity in the liquidity here means the cash outflow over the next 30 days next 30 days how much money can possibly go out from my bank that is the liquidity outflow how much of liquid cash i am having as of now that is the cover apa cover ku liquidity ku la ratio evlo irukum adu da lcr right so these liquid assets can include cash treasury bills corporate debts whatever all the items that are included under the slr are all liquid assets only under this norm and under the rbi's implementation every bank has to maintain 100 percentage liquidity coverage ratio adanna 100 percentage liquidity coverage ratio let's take an example the sbi is a bank and it is having 100 lakh rupees or 1 crore rupees as highly liquid assets as of now and it estimates that over the next 30 days 90 lakh rupees is going to outflow ஒரு தீபாவளி சீசன் எடுத்து பார்த்தீங்கன்னா நிறையா வெளியே வந்து லிக்விடிட்டி ப்ரெஷர் இருக்கும் பீப்புள் வில் பி ஆஸ்கிங் மணி தேர் பி வித் ட்ராயிங் தேர் மணி ஸோ அவுட் ஃப்ளோ இஸ் லைக்லி டு கோ ஹையர் தி அவுட் ஃப்ளோஸ் ஆர் ஹையர் ஹவு மச் ஆஃப் த மணி ஆர் லிக்விட் மணி யூ ஆர் ஹேவிங் ரைட் நவ் டு ஃபேஸ் த ரிஸ்க் தட் இஸ் இம்பினன்ட் தட் இஸ் தட் யூ ஆர் கோயிங் டு ஃபேஸ் இன் த நெக்ஸ்ட் மந்த் இதுதான் கேள்வி ஸோ இன் திஸ் எக்ஸாம்பிள் ஐ ஹாவ் ஹண்ட்ரட் லேக் பட் த லிக்விடிட்டி இஸ் நைன்டி my cover is 100 my cover is 100 liquidity is 90 liquidity outflow is 90 the cover is 100 liquidity is 90 so 90 100 by 90 idu da liquidity coverage how much cover you are having against how much liquidity you will face idu da lcr this should be 100 percentage in this example how much we are having it is more than 100 so well above the safe limit 110 percentage vechirukanga oru vela indha pokka 90 indha illa indha pokkam kammi aanchu here it is 80 here it is 100 means it will be having only 80 percentage under the basel norm it says if you are having 90 here at least maintain 90 here idha adoda artham what the rbi has done now due to the emergency of covid it has said no need to maintain 100 percentage lcr you can bring it down to 80 percentage which is going to be a great relief for the lenders clear next topic that we are going to see is a negative oil prices literally prices of oil crude oil going into the negative territory So it happened around April 20, from a new Ponovarandha Nadandhadu. So of course, I believe that all of you were hearing about it. So what are the dynamics of this? Yeah, the negative are March. Of course, we know that there has been a standstill of demand. No demand whatsoever. So this has questioned our economic thinking. So until now, oil has been always considered as one of the commodity whose demand will never fall whatever happens to the price but that is changing isn't it when forced the world will even cause oil prices to crash so it's been called as black gold by people new gold all such fancy names have been given to this commodity whose prices have fallen to the negative territory for the first time recorded in human history right so such an historic event took place so it also led to a, a host of memes and jokes that were put on this news right so whatever it is when oil prices are falling 
and as in the case negative territory kula kuda porappo it is going to be very hard for the producers so enna kenar vechirukavangala they will be reacting like this i guess <laughs> right but the immediate question that was asked in the indian media nareya ve pesna ellame what was it is if oil prices are very cheap damn cheap negative poodun sonna if it is going to the negative territory it means that a seller is going to pay you if you buy oil so that is the logical consequence isn't it but is it true unmele apdi kuduthuruvaangala right idala nam paapom but if oil prices are falling why should it why should india not import now this is the question here but india is also not in a position to import import pannalo vandiyum pole edhum pole edhu vachu who is going to fill petrol i don't know so these are certain challenges and to precisely understand or to accurately understand why id enga koranjudu how did price fall is it true that actually the commodity of oil prices fell the prices of oil the commodity ye ulla ulundich keela negative ku la ulundicha ninga poringa petrol bank ku poi ninga vaangnaina usa la prices la koranjiruchunala if you go to a petrol bank will a bank give you money for filling the tank so these are the questions we'll see to understand the oil or dynamics of oil pricing we need to know what are benchmarks the benchmark endrade certain price levels which can be used as a signal for determining your price so there are four different important prices or benchmarks in the world as of now and they are acting as benchmark benchmark means anybody who is going to buy petrol crude oil is going to look at these benchmark and accordingly he is going to sell them so this is going to be a threshold or a benchmark the ruler the lay nine thresholds are there as of now very very important threshold one are the brent crude benchmarks also called as the london brent next we have something called as the west texas intermediate dubai middle east crude nu vaanga the opec reference crude so these are the four important oil benchmarks that are available in the market as of now west texas intermediate is a kind of a crude oil which is being manufactured under in the texas region in the oklahoma region of usa understand the grade of this crude oil itself is very different its sulfur content is very low and that's why it is sometimes called as sweet crude this texas is called as sweet crude so you cannot compare west texas intermediate crude with brent crude these are different and also the refining capacity or the refining of these two requires a little bit of differences and a whole lot change in machineries and all anal the crude oil itself is differing here and across all these benchmark everything is going to track different kind of crude ellame oil na but there are few differences the so worldwide historically this has been dominating brent crude is the benchmark that has been dominating oil prices the brent crude is the cr- benchmark that has been given to the north sea or the brent sea oil the oil which was first taken from the brent sea was given a price and that became to be called as brent crude so we are also uh, india is also buying crude from this brent brent crude or prices which the india is also importing its oil remember we are not buying west texas intermediate but just because we are buying our crude oil on the basis of brent crude doesn't mean that london is providing this just a benchmark the most of our import is on the basis of the opec countries the opec countries have agreed to give us on the basis of 
Brent crude. Clear? So if West Texas Intermediates price is going to fall, India is not going to benefit. Clear? Keep that in mind. And these are the benchmarks. And this oil going into the negative territory, in the benchmark kila bochi. Brent bar kula bocha no. What fell? Yeah, we see ma'am. Right. See what fell into the negative territory? It went up to minus thirty-six, minus thirty-six dollars. Varaki bochi. WTI crude, West Texas Intermediate crude. It is not Brent. Clear? So, in the poch, does it mean? So, does it mean that if you go and buy a barrel of West Texas Intermediate crude, WTI crude, you know, you know, minus 35 could throw on No, that is not the case. Oil cannot be sold at a negative category, negative prices. Nobody will be doing that. So, what, what fell? What fell into the negative territory? To understand this, we need to know the concept of derivatives, especially something called as oil future. Imagine, imagine that oil as of today is 50, 50 dollars. In a three month time, it can become 70 dollars or it can also become 40 dollars. If I am a company who is always going to be dependent on oil, I am going to import or I, I always need to run my company on the basis of oil and I need huge gallons of oil every year to run, every month or every day to run my industry. So I will be feeling that when the prices are increasing, my operation is going to be hurt. Likewise, if this is happening, if the prices are falling, Obviously, I am going to benefit, isn't it? But here, for the seller, for the seller, he will be thinking the exact opposite. Whatever it is, the buyer or the seller, they are prone or they are vulnerable to the market fluctuation, the price fluctuation and everybody will be trying to insulate themselves against the price fluctuations. That is why we have something called as derivatives. We have had a good length discussion. What is derivative in the previous current affairs video part 2 also? You can refer that. Here imagine a situation. A is a supplier and B is a buyer. Let's just imagine that oil which is at present 50. $50 oil is going to likely fall into $40. $40 the in the month of June. In the month of June, in three month time, let's say that demand is falling or this person A has predicted that there is going to be Corona in the month of June. He is going to lose out. So what he will do, he will ask or he will be looking for a prospective buyer and he will be saying, see now the price is $50, in the month of June there are chances that the price is even going to go up. So I am going to say in the month of June I will sell you one barrel of oil at $50. And this buyer will buy this agreement or we can say the supplier will give him this agreement and say please buy in the month of June. I will give you one barrel of oil and you pay me $50. And this buyer may say okay if he feels that the prices are going to be 60 in that month. Clear? Now here. Let's say the buyer is in a desperate position and he feels that certainly it is going to be $70 in the month of June. And he will approach the supplier and he will say, if I come in the month of June, promise that you will pay me or you will give me one barrel of oil for $60. So even if he is going to 
even if the price is going to be 70 he is going to be gaining 10 dollar per barrel so this is the arrangement so he can give him a document or he can give him a document so in order to give this document they will be signing an agreement and saying please do so a and b are the people here a and b are the people here in the month of june he will give him certain barrel of oil so how much barrel of oil so this contract is called as a forward contract where a is the person who is going to supply b is a but forwards are only between two parties there is an another form of derivative called as futures Futures in the A B constant This A can change, this B can change. So whoever is having this A, whoever is having this B at the final time, he has to give. And the end of June Masa Varapo, the B R O and the B in the A to and he will give him say, please give me this. Likewise, the market. So this is called as future. Future means it can exchange hands at any level. B is an industrialist in our That is why he will be entering a forward agreement. But there are some people who are speculators. Speculators means they will be feeling. Kandipa it is $70. In the month of June it is definitely going to be 70 So I will buy oil at 60 I will I will buy a future from this person. And I will buy. And I will sell it in the spot market. I will go buy at 60 and sell it at 70. This week. And if before June. And let's say in the month of May. In the month of May itself. The price has become 80 dollars. The price has become, has become 80 dollars. But this B, buyer B is going to place somewhere else. So he doesn't want this document. He will sell this document which says 60 per dollar barrel to someone else at a huge price. And he will be gaining on that. These are the speculators. With these speculators, there will be many speculators who will be entering this kind of a derivative market and they will be buying futures. And if the future is based on oil, crude oil, it is called as oil future. Clear? One oil future itself will be nearly 1000 barrels of oil. As is a practice of USA, one future deal if you are making, it should be at least 1000 barrels of oil. So let's say if he is taking at 60, in the month of June 60, 1000 barrel of oil and he is going to sell it. For every dollar, how much is the gain? Ten dollars. So just by buying and selling, he is going to gain get a gain of thousand dollars. But remember, in between, in the June Kumuna year, this B can sell it to anyone else, and that person can be changing. June Varropo, whoever is having this particular paper in the month of June has to buy compulsorily buy from this a will supply him he has to buy this is the agreement so what happened the west texas crude oil kila koranjade edukaga koranjadu imagine there is a future which is going to end in the month of may may month end aagapodu i am the speculator i have already bought this kind of a paper. I am say I am willing to sell it to someone else. In the future, I can sell it. So I brought this future which said dollar, which is saying one uh, let's say 30, 30 dollar per West Texas crude. Per dollar is West Texas crude. If you buy in the month of if you come in the month of May, I will give you at 30. And this particular person is saying, okay, I will hold it and before the month of May, I will sell it to someone. But now in the month of May, he is definitely sure that he cannot sell it to anyone. And he is holding this particular paper. 
Dear friends, you are now in the Uru, Uru future ke evalo de barrel, thousand barrel of oil, isn't it? So what is going to happen? This particular person is going to say, now you are thirty dollars put it, you are going to thirty dollar per barrel. A person A is going to sell it to him. This person, if he is not able to send this, sell this future to anyone else in the month of May, he has to go to this buyer or the buy or the seller will come to this person and will hand him thousand barrel of oil and demand thirty dollars. Right? So thirty dollars demand banwar. Is this person? having the sufficient space to store this thousand barrels of oil. No, he could be a person like you and me who is just not interested in actual buying of crude oil, but he wants to just participate in the price fluctuation. So many people who are holding this bonds, this particular oil futures, they are in a position where they cannot sell it to anyone else. But on the other hand, they also need what? They need to take the delivery of 1000 barrel of oil. And most of them don't want to take a delivery. delivery May Maso, there is going to be an expiration of the oil future. People now in the month of April are saying, I don't want to take oil in the month of May. So please buy this future. This future, please buy this future. Nobody is able to buy this future. So this person is selling this future saying, I give you this future. I pay you money. Take this. In the future, after that, he will deliver oil to you. I don't want to store. Please take this. This is the concept. Nobody is in a position to take the delivery of oil and store it. That is why they are on a spree of selling. So when they are selling these futures, the futures, oil future price fell. Oil or a future price is now doesn't mean that the oil prices itself is falling. Clear? So this is a major difference. Immediately it fell to minus 36 and recovered it recovered okay and even the USA said I am also planning to take some amount of money and store it clear is that so at the same so we have seen the role of derivative in determining the price of West Texas intermediate group yeah yeah Brent crude. Now we have something called as Brent crude. So Brent crude is the crude at which India is buying. We said Brent crude order value no per sala increase all it is around twenty dollars. But this is a huge fall. Negative pole and allo nulla fall down. If you see in the month of January 2020, how much it was? It was around seventy dollars. Two years before it was hundred dollars per barrel of oil. Today it is fallen. So this falling price, we know that we are an importing country, and this fall in oil prices can give us benefits in the form of reduced current account deficit. The people are demanding that the government should bring it. There is another question: if the oil prices are coming down. The oil prices are coming down. Should we not? This is going to be a next point of discussion, which is point number seven, topic number seven, and something related to that, which is the strategic reserves of India. So we have seen that India is influenced by Brent oil and not WTI oil. Why is prices not falling? One. Despite the crude oil falling to historic low levels, uh, it might be even Brent also. Brent has also fallen to 20. From 70 dollars, it has fallen to 20 dollars. Why is it not translating into visible 
drop in petrol or oil prices it is because of the administrative mechanism price administrating mechanism of india in 2017 india shifted from an administrative price mechanism administrative price mechanism means every 14 days the pet the price of petrol or diesel will be decided by the government but in 2017 it went to a dynamic pricing where every morning at six o'clock the prices will be changing based on the market situation but whatever it is the price is going up or the price is coming down it is not going to affect the oil prices at which we are buying the petrol diesel price of price of adhika parapodla yeah bin sonna the tax rate if oil prices are falling crude oil prices fall adhin sonna the prices will also fall but the prices will be maintained at 70 rupees by increasing the excise duty why it is why is the excise duty increased because government wants revenue out of it so as of now the rba the government has also increased the duties excess duties increase panitanga but still there are no people to buy because massive lockdown no cars is running so no consumption at all so people are also not gaining due to this price fall the government is also not gaining because of having a higher excess duty for a question namalku people were asking if prices are falling why not store in or kelvi kalam buy now when it is very cheap buy it now and sell it later india is going to gain so this kind of a system where we are going to store crude oil is called as a strategic petroleum reserves the strategic was also a word which was in the news last last week you want to know what strategic is i want to let you hear this clip strategic opening so that is why i'm advocating for a strategic lockdown so it has to be a thought through strategic um strategic way of doing it my advice is give out as much money to the poorest weakest people as you can strategically karna hai simple tarike se nahi hoga ki bhai strategically soch kar Testing is our main weapon against the virus. It is a strategic weapon. It has to be used like a strategic weapon. Right? Uh, with this, I think you would have known what strategic means. So <laughs> whatever. We also have the concept of storing oil whenever there is going to be an emergency situation. If the cafe na na or Middle East la or crisis na na there is na la and na it will be very hard for us to even imagine a life without importing oil. That's why strategic oil door system. See here, this is a news in March 20, where India has decided to buy 5,000 crore at the current price. When it was 30 dollars k, 5,000 crore wanga no in order to fill what the strategic petroleum reserves. So India has created something called as the ISPR. What is ISPR? We'll see. The ISPR is a special purpose vehicle under the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Their only duty is to open up storage facilities out throughout India. So these storage facilities are actually caverns, sea caverns, less sea could pull caves and caverns built penny. They will be storing these kind of oils. Idhikaha storage facilities have been opened as of now. In many uh, parts we have been opening out in underground locations such as Mangalore, Vishagapatnam, Padur and it's been expanded to other places also. Government expand one on Anikiranga. But till now we have 36 million barrels store panna kudye capacity is there under the Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But just imagine how much the USA is having. 727 million barrels. 727 is nearly 20 times more than us. Either which say we can only provide 10 days of consumption. But USA can provide nearly 3 6 months of oil consumption. Right? A small history also for this. 
uh, it was the USA and a group of com countries which were affected in the oil crisis of 1973, the Kuwaiti siege and the oil crisis of 1973, the OECD countries came together and they said, we have to now store up reserves. That is why most of the OECD countries and USA countries since 1973 have been planning on building storage facilities. We on the other hand embarked on this only from 2003. So, if you question, we have a very low storage facility. In days, petrol store already it is near full capacity. Near full capacity it is hard for us to import even though oil, oil cheaper we are not able to import as of now. See, USA we were saying that the West Texas intermediate oil facility oil fell to minus 30 because there is no storage facility, every storage, all storage facility is nearly full, private in the distribution channels, USA's government storage facility, the strategic storage facility is there, that is why you can see immediately after the news, President Trump would have made an announcement saying that the government is now going to buy oil and store it, clear? So unless we are going to improve our storage facilities, we are not going to gain so much from the falling oil prices. The eighth topic that we are going to discuss is about on tap licenses. This year, the RBI had come with on tap licenses for two different areas. One is for small finance bank and the other is for payment system. What is an on tap authorization system? On tap means just as you open a tap, you open a tap and anytime you can drink water. Similarly, if you want to open a payment bank, if you want to become a small finance bank, you can go and approach the RBI and the RBI is keeping its door open throughout the year. Anytime a willing aspirant can go and say, I want to open a payment system or small finance bank. So, it has come out with this guideline for small finance bank, at least 200 crore it should have before it was 100 crore as its own equity capital. Now, it is saying 200 crore of own capital you have to raise. After that, come and apply for small finance bank license. Likewise, if you are a payment bank who wants to be upgraded to the level of small finance bank, at least for 5 years you have, to have completed operations. If it is an urban cooperative bank, urban cooperative bank like PMC bank, if you are a bank like PMC, you can come and if you should have at least 100 crore now, but in 5 years, you should increase your shareholders or equity money to 200 crores. So, these are the eligibility criteria for on tap licensing for small finance bank. The other is for payment system. It says that if you want to have an operating unit under the Bharat bill payment system, you should have at least 100 crore. If you are having a trade related discounting system or MSMEs, you will be having electronic trade discounting system where you will just go place the trade receivables and you will be given money or finance on top of that. So, that is at least 25 crores you should have if you want to open up a new TREDS system and if for white label ATM system, you need at least 100 crores. So, these are the payment system which will be on tap. Now is the question, do we have on tap licensing system for scheduled commercial banks? No. You cannot. For example, you and I are going to say, say now let us open a bank. And let's go and apply for a bank license in RBI. It will not be there. Only when the RBI is going to say that I am going to invite applications, then you can do. Last time it invited application, it was in the year 2014, where Bandhan Bank and IFC were given licenses. After that, it has not been. So it is not on tap license for banking systems. Okay? The ninth topic that we are going to discuss is the IFSC Authority Bill. The Indian Financial Services Center in India, there is only at present one IFSC that is the gift city. So, what is this IFSC authority? Understand the IFSC is a special kind of a unique kind of a SEZ special economic zone where they will be providing financial services 
to the foreign markets. We want India to be a financial hub like London and Singapore and that is why we came up with the system of International Financial Services Centre. We are on the plan of opening more IFSC. The first IFSC that was opened was the gift city in Gujarat. So currently there are a lot of companies which can open within the premises of the gift. It could be a banking company, it could be a capital market company, insurance company, but all of these are regulated. Even though they are under the IFSC, they are regulated by their respective regulators. For example, if you are a bank, the RBI. If you are under the capital market, the SEBI will be coming. If you are under the pension, if the PFIR, if your insurance, likewise, there is a multiplicity of regulation and this is not leading to or facilitating more companies to come up under the gift of the IFSE. That's why a unified regulator was needed. We needed a unified regulator. In the unified regulator, a bill was passed both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha called as the IFSC authority and this authority will act. It will replace all of them and it will act as a regulator for all IFSC like gift. So this authority is not a single me member body, a single person. It is going to be a nine member committee which includes a chairperson. Each one nomination from RBA, SAB, PFRBA and IFRDA, so total 5, 2 will be representing the Ministry of Finance from the government and 2 will be experts which will be nominated or selected by a search panel of the government. So totally 9 of them as of now in the bill has produced that if they will have a 3 year tenure and they will also be eligible for reappointment. The last topic that we are going to discuss is the ease of doing business index. Since 2003, the World Bank has been publishing doing business report under which it will rank all sta different states under different criteria. So this time, consistent with India's performance over the last five years, India has jumped this year also to 63rd position in the ease of doing business report. So what is this report about? What are the indexes in it? I hope you all know it. Just a recap. So it is going to <coughs> not so labor market regulation even though it is going to assess it. It is not an visible criteria here. So starting a business, dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, registering property, protecting minority interests, trading across border, paying taxes, enforcing. These are the 10 parameters across which every state, every country will be ranked. So this year, there has been significant improvements. Overall, we have been, we have improved from 77 to 63. This includes the jump is mainly due to this resolving insolvency. As we know, some years back, we were around the 140 mark. A huge jump to 52, it has been made possible due to the IBC. Right? Likewise, the trading across borders, registering property, uh, sorry, uh, dealing with construction permits, we have made most of the process online, so this has also become easy. But remember, not in, not in all areas we have improved. One major irritant in ease of doing business is this enforcing contract. You know how enforcements are done in India? It is through the judiciary. Enforcement is very, very slow. That is why we have been always maintaining a very low record in this enforcing contracts. The changes to the ease of doing business this year. There has been two important New parameters also included, one is employing workers, how many workers have been employed, the ease with which you are employing workers and how much of the contracting work is done with the government. So These are two parameters, so totally 12, but this year these two have not been used for ranking purposes, but it has been in the assessment of the report. Likewise, one of the Criticisms against this EODB is that it is only going to measure against 
Delhi and Mumbai. Till now, it was only measuring India's ease of doing business on the basis of Delhi and Mumbai. Now, it has expanded it to Kolkata and Bangalore. And in the forthcoming years, many states, many cities will also be added. Right? With this, we are ending our discussion. I hope it was fruitful for you. Thank you. with which you are employing workers and how much of the contracting work is done with the government. So these are two parameters. So totally 12. But this year, these two have not been used for ranking purposes, but it has been in the assessment of the report. Likewise, one of the criticisms against this EODB is that it is only going to measure against Delhi and Mumbai. Till now, it was only measuring India's ease of doing business on the basis of Delhi and Mumbai. Now, it has expanded it to Kolkata and Bangalore. And in the forthcoming years, many states, many cities will also be added. Right? With this, we are ending our discussion. I hope it was fruitful for you. Thank you.